Good morning, welcome to Trinity, and I invite you to take out your bulletin, and let's highlight a few announcements, see what's going on in the next few days around here. Please notice the registration form, and I invite you to take just a moment and fill it out, place it in the offering plate later on in the service. Today we have a church conference at 4.30 in C-102. This is for the chairpersons of all our church committees. Come on out at C-102 and we'll talk and plan about the upcoming uh, months and make sure we're not stepping on one another in our, our events. Also tonight we'll have a celebration worship time at 6 p.m. in the youth room. Come on out for that. This, this morning, many of our youth, not all of our youth, but many of our youth uh, are up at Camp to Know Him at Pisgah, Alabama. They'll be finishing up early this afternoon and traveling back. But please continue to pray for them as they finish their retreat. Pray for their chaperones as they finish the retreat. And uh, we are thankful for the youth that take time away and our chaperones that go up there and chaperone this trip and teach and, and uh, they pour their lives into our youths and they come on back and they sign up to do it again. <laughs> Uh, please notice our angel trees. We put up our angel tree, uh, went up today. Uh, it's out here in the gathering area. These are for our special, there are children in our community that are not going to be able to have Christmas provided for them. And their instructions on the back side of the, the angel, the pink angels are the girl angels and the blue angels are the boy angels. Uh, instructions are out there, but if you have any questions, see me. The dates are, everything's out there. But if you have any questions, uh, uh, see me. We'll have a special call church conference on this Wednesday night, November 14th, to present the 2013 budget uh, that's being called by our finance committee, and it'll be meeting in the uh, fellowship hall. And also, please see the announcement about the activities concerning our new uh, Minister of Music candidate. On Saturday, uh, the choir meets with uh, this candidate at 9 a.m. Uh, Taylor will meet with them from uh, the, with the youth at 10:15. At 11, the entire church is invited out to meet with him and even have lunch. At 12:30, Taylor will share his testimony. And then next Sunday, we'll have a special call church conference after each service to vote on Taylor coming to be our new minister of music. Uh, this committee has done a fantastic job. If you see them, give them an add a boy and add a girl. Uh, one other thing I'd say is uh, uh, his bios are kind of scattered around the church. I've seen some in the uh, foyer, they're in the gathering area, and some in the choir room. But he's an impressive man, and I look forward to working with him. But uh, pray about his transition coming here to be our minister of music. Thank you for hearing the announcements. Now I invite you into a time of worship. I'll read you a passage of scripture from James 1, 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Our focus today in worship is the gift of the poor widow. Welcome to Trinity. Let us pray. Father, until man under, can, under, mankind understands the full measure of your love and grace for us, we will continue to have need for David's to face Goliath's. We ask your blessing and watch care for those fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, sisters, and brothers or cho who choose to be David today and in the past. Father, we thank you for your help as we try to help those families which are anxious for their loved ones and that these loved ones who are serving in foreign lands, Lord, may be under your watch care. Father, we pray for the families 
where their source of stability, their fo source of fatherly love, motherly love, are no longer there at their house. May we ever look to you for guidance, Lord, as we try to meet the needs of these veterans who are out serving to protect us. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin the congregational music portion of our service this morning with number 282. I would invite you to reach for that hymn book in front of you and turn to that number. We sing Living for Jesus, all three verses, standing as we sing. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free, this is the pathway of blessing for me. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall Give henceforth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love. Love constrains me to answer his call. Follow his leading and give him my all. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to scripture passage for the day is Mark 12 verses 38 through 44 and that can be found on page 718 in your pew Bible. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. 
They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. And for a show, make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning. I'd like to take a moment to uh, share with you a little bit about Global Missions. Um, I don't know if you've had the the benefit of doing this, but I have had about three trips to foreign, uh, uh, on a foreign mission trips to different parts of the world. I've been to Brazil and Ecuador. I guess that's not two different parts of the world, but they're kind of close. Um, but, but my mission opportunities have dealt with evangelism to medical missions to um, building a church. Um, all of those have been wonderful experiences for me. And, and as part of those experiences, I've got to work with missionaries in these different part areas of the, the, the uh, globe. And, and what a wonderful job that they're doing. And I get an opportunity to go for a week or two weeks and then get to come back to the, to the comforts of home. And yet these individuals have given their lives, dedicated their lives to living in these different parts of the world and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, Today in your pews and throughout this uh, uh, first part of November, uh, you will have opportunities to give to two wonderful global mission organizations, Lottie Moon, sponsored by the SBC. Uh, For example, uh, one of the individuals that I was reading about for Lottie Moon uh, is a group or a couple working in Japan, and their focus is on those who are deaf and their ministry is to that. And they shared a testimony about a woman whose life was devoted to Buddha and that she would never change. And then when reading and uh, hearing, hearing through um, signals and reading uh, as she was, she learned about Jesus Christ. And through that, she became a Christian, and they rejoiced. And in the CBF program, uh, I learned about a couple in Uganda who are dealing with refugees, and, and, and they are taking them in and helping them to learn English and to be able to get a job, and, and through that, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I tell you today that, that you couldn't go wrong, but the area that you could go wrong in, I guess, is by not giving. If you have some extra money, or if you can give beyond uh, what you normally give, we would appreciate it so much. Uh, It it does such a wonderful job, and those folks in uh, those uh, 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 missionary uh, ministries throughout the world would greatly appreciate your gifts. Thank you. As we stand in just a moment, you will see the note in our worship order that our pre-K and kindergarten children can leave for their special time of worship as we uh, allow for them each service, so we will observe that today. Uh, You will see also that our next song, the hymn of service, is something for thee. It's hymn number 607. I encourage you to sing with us. We're going to sing the first, third, and last. Let's stand and sing together.
As we pause now for this time we call Be Still and Know, uh, I thought about uh, what I might want to do during this time with you, but I consider that most of the time when we come to church, all of us have things on our hearts, concerns, or needs, uh, things that are worrying us, and things that we would like to pray about when we're in church. And this is our time to do that. Uh, we heard earlier that our, most of our youth are at uh, Camp to Know Him, and they're on their way back today. You may want to take this time to pray for our youth, for safety as they travel back, but also for just the continuing shaping work that our church offers to them in spiritual formation as they grow up uh, and find their way in the Lord. You may also note on our prayer concerns list, there are a lot of names on there, people who are our friends and neighbors, relatives, and they all have specific needs. There are people in the hospital and rehab now that are part of this church or connected to us. You might want to lift them up in prayer during that time. You may have something on your heart that's just private to you that you'd like to pray about in the sanctuary of your church. And then finally, I want to mention to you, as Glenn said earlier, we're excited about Taylor Johnson coming next week, our prospective minister music candidate. He'll be here uh, Saturday, and there's a schedule in the bulletin there. I hope that you'll pray for Taylor and pray as a group, as a congregation, as we seek God's leadership in a calling process, as we call a minister here. I think you're going to enjoy getting to know Taylor, and you'll like him very much. It's a young minister, but I think someone that Trinity will make an investment in, and we will find that God will continue to bless through him uh, in the ministry that we're doing and the things I believe God has for our future. But it's important that we pray about that process and know that this is a calling process. So I hope that that will be something you'll want to lift up to the Lord. At this time, let's bow and just have a moment in this time of silence for you to pray whatever's on your heart. And the Lord does surely hear our prayers. Amen.
Before I begin, I'd like to remind us that today is Veterans Day, and I hope that we will take the opportunity, if we get that, to thank a veteran, someone who has served uh, in our uh, armed forces or an active duty personnel now, and thank them for their commitment and dedication to the cause of freedom, including the freedom for us to gather in worship, uh, but also the sacrifice that their families uh, give. Tuck mentioned some of that in his prayer as well. We're grateful for those who are willing to, to give of their time and their commitment of part of their life to, to serving those causes of freedom. You ever feel like uh, you go unnoticed? I do sometimes. You, you try your best, you give your best effort to something, and uh, you know you sort of wish somebody would say a word of thanks to you and pat you on the back or whatever. Now, I know Ms. Frankie Haynes is here today. We're so glad you're here visiting with us. That whole row right there, they're good about patting folks on the back, aren't they? Gene Mabry's notes and cards of thank you mean so much to me, for example. Um, it's nice to get that, isn't it? Everybody, I think, probably would be glad if you had an appreciation day for you. We deserve that. We work hard and we try. But a lot of times that doesn't happen, does it? We don't get noticed maybe the way we should. We don't have the support maybe we should. I want you to know that Jesus does notice you. Jesus does notice you, notices your life, takes note of the way you live, both the bad and the good. But God cares so much about us that God looks over our lives and takes care of us. Jesus was a great observer of life. The Gospels teach us that. In the Gospels, for example, we're told that one of the days that Jesus was walking through this little town of Jericho, there was a wee little man named Zacchaeus who climbed up in a sycamore tree in order to get a better look at Jesus. And it was Jesus who noticed this man up in the tree and called him down so he could go to have supper with him that day. Really changed Zacchaeus' life. We remember that while Jesus was going about his very busy life and the mission and purpose that he had and so many people crowded around him and one day there was a man who was blind who was crying out on the streets on the sides and people were telling him to be quiet and to hush. But Jesus stopped. Uh, even though he was so busy, he stopped and talked to this guy and healed the blind man who was on the side of the road. There was once a woman who had uh, a blood flow problem and was ill for many, many years, for about 12 years. And she was so desperate in her faith that she thought if she could just touch the hem of the garment of a holy man, she might get better. She did touch the hem of Jesus' garment. She did get better, but Jesus didn't let it end there. He noticed her. He stopped and not only noticed the power going from him during that time, but he called her out and recognized her in the midst of that big crowd and said to her, you belong. You are a daughter of Israel. Uh, you belong. That's a pretty nice thing to know. And one of the, I think one of the greatest parables he told was probably from his observation of what was going on around him in life. It was a parable of a farmer who was broadcasting the seed as he's sowing the crop. You remember some part of it fell on rocky ground, some on good soil. Jesus was a good observer of life and notices us still, I think. In the story that we heard read uh, this morning, we hear of another opportunity for Jesus to observe someone that other folks usually would not notice. This poor widow woman who was at the treasury that day, uh, probably nobody else took note of her offering to the cause of God in the temple, but, but Jesus did. She was at the temple in the court of the women where the women were confined during that day and time in their religion. And it was interesting enough, that's where they put these receptacles that looked like trumpets, and that's where you would go and put your offering down into. Uh, I've always thought it was interesting that they put the offering stuff in the court of the women. They probably remember that women throughout history have been pivotal in supporting the work of God, uh, whether it's the temple or the church. Well, she was there, and she gave all she had. We think about this as the story of the widow's might, uh, equivalent of a couple of pennies maybe, uh, in value, she put it in, the offering. And Jesus, to, to bring a finer point to it, calls his disciples over and says to them, in case you didn't notice, I want you to pay attention to this, what has happened. This widow who has given everything to the support of her faith. Now, you might be saying to yourself, today we get a stewardship sermon. Oh boy, this is going to be fun. Well, you'd be partly right. It is about stewardship, but it is about stewardship of something much greater than the things that we can write a check for, the things that are in our wallets or our bank accounts. I want you to ask yourself today a very important question. What are you giving your best to in life? What matters the most to you? And how are you spending your life 
doing the very best you can on that thing or that person or that situation that matters the most to you? Is it something you were meant to do? Are you doing what you believe God is calling you to do? How are you spending your life? In the country song, Cowboys and Angels, there's a line in there where the guy sings and he says, I'll die for her and she lives for me. What are you giving your very best to in this world? Jesus commends this widow woman to us, not only for her gift, but I think also he is saying to all of us, even the very least person in the kingdom of God, the most unnoticed of, of any of us, is of value to God and can make a contribution that makes a tremendous, inspiring difference for the kingdom of God. This woman gave all she had, her livelihood, to the support of the temple. Now, when you hear this story and stories like this of great inspiration, I think it's important not to place her up on a pedestal. That's not what this story should be about. We sometimes do that. People who do significant, so-called so extraordinary things, we sometimes put them up as very special people. And I guess she is special. But when we do that, we sometimes create distance between our situations in life and a person like this widow who Jesus pointed out and noticed that day. When we do that, it creates the possibility for us to have an excuse of saying, I can never be like that special person. I'm only an ordinary person. Well, she was an ordinary person. She just did something very extraordinary that any of us could do. Several years ago, Mary and the boys and I went to Mobile and we visited the USS Alabama battleship there. It's a submarine there. And by the way, I don't, our boys are tall. I don't know how you could fit on those little beds in those submarines, especially back in the World War II times. But we tried it. While we were there, there's a building nearby where you can get food and stuff, and there's a wall of people from Alabama of pictures of people from Alabama who won the Congressional Medal of Honor for their service. And as I looked at that, I noted some important things about them. All of them were from Alabama. Some of them were highly educated. Some of them had never graduated from high school. Some of them were for cities in our state, and some from little towns and little rural areas that I don't even know where they would be on a map. They were regular folks from the same dirt I walk on, from the same place where I'm from, regular people, people like you and like me from Alabama. And yet they, those regular, ordinary people, were able to do something extraordinary, sometimes ultimately giving their lives for something they believed in. Back at Williams, our custodian who was there for many years was Ralph Green. Ralph was uh, an ordinary, common, good, down-to-earth man. He was a farmer. I never would have guessed he was a chemist. He was just simple and easy to talk to. He also fought in almost every major battle in World War II in the European theater. But he didn't talk about that much. He did talk to his pastor about it. He was wounded several times and did some things that were incredibly brave. And he deserved and received medals for those things. After Ralph passed away, he was a custodian of the church, as I said. He always had this closet where he kept his supplies. We put a little sign up saying, Ralph's Closet. It's going to be there probably for a long time. It's an ordinary, simple man from Alabama who grew up like you and I and had the opportunity to step up and do something important, and he did it. He didn't brag about it. He just did it. I think Jesus is telling us in this story of this widow woman that any person who chooses, any of us can do something extraordinary with our lives. You remember that movie, Facing the Giants? I like that movie. The church in Georgia produced it. And one of the things about it is a football team, and they're struggling. The coach one day is trying to get them, you know, pepped up and show them they can actually achieve more than they believe that they can achieve. And one of the things he has them do is a bear crawl drill. If you've ever played football, you know the bear crawl. You get on all fours, and you're going to crawl. Except for on this drill, he put a player on the back of the guy who's doing the bear crawl. So you're carrying that load as you're doing the bear crawl. And in one of the scenes, one of the big players is trying that. He says, I can't go more than 10 yards. There's no way, coach, we can do this. We're just tired. We just can't do it. So he blindfolds the player, puts the other guy on top of him and says, now just go as far as you can. And when he takes the blindfold off, the guy has gone the full 100 yards. He's crossed the goal line all the way. And he's surprised at himself because when he saw what he thought about were the limitations of what he could accomplish. 
But when those things were blinded from him, he was able to give more effort than he even believed he could give. But by giving that effort, he inspired that whole team. I want to ask you again, what are you giving your best to? Maybe you can do more than you believe you can do. Maybe you can be more of an inspiration, an inspiration Jesus notices and recognizes and points out as a hero in the kingdom of God. Mary's mama is always sending the boys and us these inspirational books and quotes and things like that, always wanting to inspire us, always wanting us to achieve, always wanting us to know that God's with us. And several years ago, she gave us a book called 212 Degrees. That's the boiling point of water. And in the book, it talks about when it gets 212 degrees, water becomes steam. And steam has the power to make an engine like a train move down the tracks. Just that one degree, though, in the book is often what's missing for many people's lives. They go 211 degrees, but just one degree more of effort, of time, of commitment, of dedication might be what it takes to get the water to steam, to drive the engine, to make something extraordinary and incredible happen. I want to ask you, what are you passionate about? What do you care about enough that you're willing to go that extra degree? That you're willing to see what you might be capable of with God's strength, what can happen through you in your life. And even though if it causes you to sacrifice to go the extra mile or make the extra effort or the extra degree, maybe it causes you to sacrifice a little bit, but you count that as nothing because the joy of doing it and giving yourself to it or to this people or to this cause is so joyful and so happy inside of you that you don't mind doing those kinds of things. What are you giving your life to? How are you spending your life and are you giving your best to the things that God has called you to do and accomplish in this world? No pedestals here for anybody. Jesus has said that anyone who wants to be can be my disciple. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must sacrifice. They must take up their cross. They must deny themselves and they must follow me. But he didn't say any of you very special, dedicated Christians, you can be my disciple and you can be an inspiring pedestal example to all of the other ordinary followers of mine. No, Jesus said any one of us who wants to be, if they choose, they can be my disciple. And you know, many of the greatest people probably in our own stories, in our own lives, who were those disciples, those inspiring people of Christ for us, many of those are not widely known among others, but they're heroes in our own lives. You got heroes like that? My grandmother, Mama Bobby, was one of those for me. When I was younger, I was diagnosed with hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, and one of the ways that they treated that was for me to have to eat at regular scheduled times. On weekends, and oftentimes every other weekend, I would go to my daddy's. My grandmother would be there, and she'd help take care of everybody. And one of the things that teenagers do on Saturdays is not get up early in the morning. And I didn't want to get up early in the morning, and especially just to get up to eat breakfast. But my grandmother knew I was supposed to do this. And so she sacrificially would get up on those Saturdays and those Sunday mornings and make bacon and eggs and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying I didn't like it, but... But she would wake me up and I would eat that and enjoy that. She was taking care of me. My grandmother also liked to drive around what she called the old ladies. She'd take them to the store, to the wire, or wherever they needed to go. Now, those old ladies were the same age she was, but she called them the old ladies. And she loved driving them around and taking care of them. A lot of folks don't know who that was. I don't know her name, but I do, and God does. God noticed her effort and her sacrifice, and I think she was a hero. She's my hero, one of mine. And probably he wrote a lot of those old ladies have gone on to glory now. Any one of us is capable of being that kind of person in the kingdom of God. Find something that you can put everything into. And when you find that thing that God has called you to do, that's special, that's unique for you, I want to challenge you to give your best to it. Don't give 211 degrees when only 212 would really make the difference. Give your best to it. What matters to you today? The world needs more people of passion. People who are passionate and care about something. Well, I think we need more people who have a devotion and a willingness to sacrifice for things like their marriages, 
who want to give everything they need to give to a woman or to a man that they've been called by God to marry for the rest of their lives. Or maybe the devotion and sacrifice that it causes us to give to our children, to raise up children with the values that they need to have, with the guidance and the direction that will help them get through this world that's often hard to live in. People who are willing to give dedication and devotion and commitment to politics, to communities, and to their faith and to their churches. You know, about a week or so ago, I saw two young men in white shirts and ties riding bicycles in our community. They were Mormon kids who were on mission. I'm not saying I embrace the Mormon religion, but I do admire their willingness to, uh, to dedicate themselves to mission and to put their faith into practice. I admire their devotion. I think we all could learn something from that. I'm asking us simply to think about what matters. How you spend this short life that you live. And what are you giving to that thing that matters to you? Are you giving your best all that you have? You know, several Christians got together at some point in time and said, there are a lot of sins that we commit in our lives, but there are seven deadly sins. Y'all know about the seven deadly sins? And one of those seven deadly sins, they said, is the sin of sloth. Sloth is essentially taking the gifts that God has given you and sitting on them, not using them. Sitting on your time, sitting on your money, sitting on your gifts, sitting on the presence that you could give, but you're too slothful, sinfully so, so to give that. That's hard to say, sinfully softful, but you get the point. I think we're tempted to put these people who do those extra things on a pedestal because we deep down know that's the way it's supposed to be. That's why we admire it so much. We deep down know that every one of us is called to be special. That God knows we can be and should be great in the kingdom of God. Each of us has something we can do that matters. And maybe matters in an eternal way for somebody. Each of us has a life that God has given us as a gift. And the gift is intended to be spent well. To make a difference. And I think it's something any of us can do, whether it's a poor widow from ancient Israel to the people who live today, who just simply choose to give an extra degree to what they believe in, to what they're called to do, to what they really care about, who can find a treasury they're willing to just dump it all in the trumpet because they believe that's where the investment of their life should be. I'm asking us to consider what we believe in, what we're called to do, what we're supposed to spend our life doing, and I'm asking us to, to look within and say to ourselves, am I giving my best to what God has asked me to do with my life? I think this story is about that. But it's also about finding something that's worthy of your life. Find something to do and give it your best. But sure, make, make sure that it's worth your time and your money, and your life, and your dedication. If it's unworthy, you'll have spent your life in vain. Jesus once said, there are those who will store up treasures, but they will be in places where wrath, moth, and rust, and thief can steal them and take it from them. So I want to ask you a second question. Whatever you're giving your best to, is it worthy of your time and your life? and your commitment. There are things in this world that will suck our life away. They will divert us from what's most important. This temple where Jesus was in that day, he had walked to get there, and as he was on his path, he saw a fig tree, and he condemned the fig tree in the story, cursed it, the Bible says, because the fig tree was supposed to produce figs. That's what it was created to do. It's a fig tree, but it wasn't doing its job. Jesus, I think, symbolically curses and condemns that fig tree for not doing what it's supposed to be, what it was created to do. And then he goes to the temple and does the same thing. He condemns the temple because that place of religion was not doing and producing what it was supposed to do and what it was supposed to 
to be caused to do in this world by God. It was unworthy. And really, it was unworthy of the widow's might that she gave. What are things like that in your life? We probably all have them, and they will suck the life from us. Jobs that are going nowhere, people and relationships that don't deserve our very best, that are not taking care of us because that's the way relationships should be. I remember when I was growing up in Hoax Bluff, I dated a girl named Donna. Her brother had been engaged for seven years to a girl. And I got to thinking, that girl's wasted a lot of her life. I don't know if they ever got married or not. Mark Twain came from humble background, and he always was worried about money, always afraid he'd go back to poverty. So he always wanted to find a way to strike it rich. And one of the things he found was a guy who was an inventor of a typesetting machine. And so he poured money into that idea. And the guy kept writing to him over and over again, I'm close, I just need a little more money. Mark Twain spent millions equivalent today, millions of dollars on a pipe dream, on a lottery that never came in for him. There are things like that in our lives. People, causes, investments of time and effort. You know, another song I really like is, Time is Love. There's a lot of things that demand our time. Love's one of them. The people you love, the things you love, the things the God of love has called you to do is one of those things too. I want to caution our church about being worthy because we're going to ask a lot of time from you and money and commitment and gifts and talents and presents. We need to be worthy of that gift of your life. You know, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. And, you know, they found in its treasury a hoard of money, a lot of gold, a lot of coins, a lot of stuff. This was the temple that God had charged with giving it all away because that was the work of the temple. Not to hoard it, but to use it to advance the causes of God to serve those who were less fortunate in this world. You know, a church can have a really high bank balance, but Jesus can see it as bankrupt because it's not doing and producing what a church is supposed to do. I want to ask us to always keep our church accountable, to be worthy of the gift. This widow, you know, she gave her last two pennies to the temple. The temple was supposed to be serving the very widows who are supporting the temple. And it wasn't doing its job. And Jesus said, I will tear it down. But in three days, I will rebuild something better in my body. It's the body of Christ. Church, if we're supposed to follow Jesus, we got to remember Jesus gave it all away. Gave his life away to what he believed in, to what he trusted, to where his faith was. He was walking up Calvary to even give his life for that cause. We need to caution ourselves always not to lay up riches when we are called to give ourselves away to, Right? That's what it means to be a Christian church. We are called to serve the poor, to help those who are less fortunate than us, to seek and to save the lost, to bind up the wounded of heart and body. We are called to visit the lonely. We are called to be the very presence of Jesus. If not, we're not being a Christian church. If not, we're not worth our salt, are we? Trinity is 25 years old, and I think it's a great church. But every year, every month, and every day, we have to work hard to hold ourselves accountable to be worthy of the gift, to be worthy as a Christian church. We need to earn it every day and not ever take it for granted. We earn it by simply being faithful to Jesus. I think it's important that you give your best to something in life, and I hope you find it. But I think part of that should be your faith. Give your best to your faith. Give your best to what God has called you to be. 
there are a lot of people like these scribes who are giving to their faith, but it's out of their abundance. It's extra. It doesn't cost them a whole lot. It's their pocket change. The widow, she gives sacrificially. She knows what it's like to be close to Jesus who gave sacrificially. Some of us don't know what that's like. We're sitting on our money. We're sitting on our time. And we're sitting on our gifts. We're supposed to be giving our best to the work of the kingdom of God. If not, we're probably storing up some treasure in some places that will disappear. And we will find at our end that we have spent a lot of our time in vain. I'm asking you to consider what God is calling you to do and to be. What kind of Christian you will be. And I'm asking you to give your very best to what you believe matters for your life. I'm also going to ask you to keep our church accountable. To make sure we're worthy of being the body of Christ here in Madison. We need to share good news. We need to come here and worship with all our hearts and our souls and our minds and our strength. There were people who worked really hard in Jesus' day to be noticed by God. And all the while, God was watching. Jesus does take notice of us. He saw through it. And he noticed one woman who was overlooked by everybody else. And he lifted her up, just like I think he wants to do for all of us, if we're willing, if we want to be his disciple. He noticed this ordinary person and he said, there's a hero. Disciples, y'all come over and look at this. There's a hero in the kingdom. An ordinary person who did an extraordinary thing. And in Jesus' eyes, any one of us can be that kind of person. I'm asking you to give your best to something. To something you believe in. That's worthy of your gift. And know that Jesus will notice when you do. And Jesus will be with you. And Jesus will help you. Jesus will notice you. Jesus will be with you. And Jesus will help you. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship, we value community and global missions, and there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.